questions about um, you know how that can um, progress, and so you know you'll get a sense of where we think things are at, and uh, and you know maybe best practice for moving forward. But would also love to you know hear from those of you that um, you know want to share any uh, impressions that that you have or you know ideas for going forward. Um, so, with that being said, I'll um, introduce you briefly to, you know, who's here tonight, um, and, you know, I will not give much more of an explanation than is right here, you know, in, in ahead of you, um, but, uh, you know, on the paper, because you, you may have seen the flyer um, that was done up, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background. Uh, so. We've got um, Michael Oshman um, here at the end, or the beginning, whichever way you're facing, um, who is the CEO, founder of the Green Restaurant Association, uh, who started that out in San Diego, and um, I believe, and uh, then took his, uh, his business to, um, to Boston. And, um, uh, and I'll tell you more you know, in a little bit about how Michael and I started working together, but um, uh, we've had a seven-year relationship uh, working together. Um, and over here, Eric McNulty, who's um, got a business, uh, Richer Earth, and he's the sustainability leadership catalyst. Um, and, um, and, you know, in that guise, uh, approached me about concentrating first not just on Brookline as a whole, but on the community that he and I both live in and um, work in, and that is Washington Square. And, uh, you know, Eric can expound on it more, but, you know, his idea was, you know, let's focus on this one area that, that we live in, and if we can get um, a handful of restaurants to be um, more ecologically responsible in this area and become a certified green restaurant, we could actually be, as far as we know, the first green restaurant district in the country, uh, which would be really neat. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit about our experiences, you know, trying to bring that about. Um, so with that being said, um, I'd love to introduce you to uh, Michael Oshman for us to kick it off. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Sure. So one of the things that we thought before we get started introducing who we are and um, furthering what Jim said about the green dining zone um, is to start out with you all. So you all took your time to come out this evening, and we thought when we were planning this that it would be fun for us and each of you to see why are you here. What inspired you about what you heard on the flyer? Um, what's your relationship to the environment? These are big questions. Um, but if we can keep them to a minute or under for each person, we can say our name, maybe where you live, and what uh, brought you here today. And then we'll wrap it back up, and then we'll kind of continue with what we're doing here and share some really exciting things, as Jim said. So if you could share your name, where you live, what brings you here tonight? One minute or under. My name is Dan Norman. I live on Howard Avenue in Woodbine, mm -hmm. Uh I'm here because my wife knew about this and suggested we come. So that's why I'm here. We're interested in preserving the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested to know uh, this is concentrated or aimed at green restaurants. How about green groceries? Mm -hmm. We do a lot of cooking at home, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. We don't eat out all that much, mm -hmm. occasionally at the fireplace, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. but, uh, how about the restaurants? Do they, are there any, I mean, and how about the groceries? Are there any groceries that are conscious of serving local food uh, and with a green right. edge? That's a good question. That's me. Okay. We're also friends with Jim, and we do go to the fireplace for colonial activities and other events as well. 
Uh, but um, we are also trying to uh, uh, teach our children uh, to be more ecologically, our adult children, I say, should say, to be more ecologically minded. And they probably eat in restaurants more than we do. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, also, we have a son, a farmer. Yeah. And so we also have to be aware that we have to support the farmers and the green community as mm -hmm. well. And we all need to be uh, to learn more about all of these issues yeah. because we don't know enough. Thank you. My name is John Grew. I live not too far from here, <clears throat> which was formerly the Women's Free Hospital. Um, and um, I heard about this at the last minute. Uh, Claudia Delano renounced the Rotary. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, to put it mildly, a foodie. Mm -hmm. I love to cook. I love good food. I love to eat out. I'm a great, I cling to the Zagat ratings. Mm -hmm. And the fireplace is one of my favorite places in Brookline. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to see what distinguishes it more. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Danielle. Uh, I live near Coolidge Corner. And I'm working at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Um, and I found out about this lecture when I took a drawing class um, through the same program. And I am actually looking for a bit of career inspiration. Um, I graduated four years ago and am still a bit unsure of where life is going to take me. So, you know, I love the environment, um, sustainability issues, and love the food, of course. So, Could you speak up a little bit? Um, okay. <coughs> I'm Ann McNulty, and I'm Eric's wife. I live in Washington Square, obviously, and uh, have always been concerned with Eric about um, the uh, amount of waste, actually, that occurs in restaurants. Water usage, electricity usage, um, waste with um, byproducts of food of all sorts. And um, I joined with Eric about um, better the environment with helping the restaurants be aware of how to help the environment and use some of that overuse to good use. Uh, I'm Jim Reardon. I'm actually from Boston. I'm not from this morning. That's okay. We won't hold it against you. <laughs> I have been from fireplace. <laughs> my interest is actually we're building two green food trucks in Boston. Mm. And or I want to get some ideas on what you guys are doing. Oh, great. The truck is meant to be green, but it's going to be served, it's going to be organic. Um, it's going to be right, My name is Linda Larson. Um, I live in Randolph. I know Ooh, that. Wow. <laughs> but I used to run the Brooklyn Adult Ed program, retired about six years ago. and. Um, Claudia today announced your program at Rotary. I'm a member of the Rotary Club too, along with John Crew. And I uh, thought it was just a wonderful, wonderful topic. Uh, since I retired, my husband calls me a farm wife. Yes. And really, <laughs> <laughs> my interest is in, in food and foraging for food. And you talk about going into grocery stores. Mm. I rarely do. You know, I buy my, my fish from a guy in Hull, and I buy my vegetables from Western Mass with a CSA that's mm. all organic. I get my milk, my raw milk, out in Foxborough. So I'm, I'm really interested. I, I became really interested in eating a diet that that was uncontaminated and also was closer to nature. And, and because of that, I got more in, in interested in how food is raised and what how important that whole cycle is and what happens to the earth, and the soil, and how we treat the animals that we get our food from. So I'm interested in the whole cycle. And there's only two places I would eat. We, you know, we eat home all the time because it's good, really good food. There's only two places that I will eat out or recommend. And one is the fireplace, and the other is Cuckoo's Cafe. Those are the only two places that I'll eat out because I don't know what I'm getting otherwise. Hmm. Not to give you a plug, Jim, but it's great. Jim, I've got this. I got this all on video, Jim. Just so you, know. <laughs> you can get them to sign off on it. Yeah, thank you. I love Cuckoo's. <laughs> 
a registered dietitian and uh, I'm now working for Genesis Healthcare. Um, the Coolidge House is one of our facilities in Coolidge Corner. And uh, it's a, like a 150 bed short term rehab center. And uh, I just see a lot of wastage. And I'm just wondering how we can transfer some of these principles to a healthcare facility. Mm -hmm. And still with these really tight fiscal um, guidelines. Um, you know, the cheapest of everything is purchased. You know, it's a for profit health care. I'm just uh, interested in that. Okay. Thank you. My name is Erin Rosa. I'm actually a volunteer here at the um, But I'm actually from Vermont originally, and the whole idea of I mean, my father always. Um, big gardens and we raised tomatoes and you name it and we can bake and depending on the season what it was, you know, we had all different kinds of fruits and berries and um, I think one of my major concerns, I don't know if this is anything that you talked about this <coughs> evening, but how much plastic we use um, in the environment. Um, I, I know for example I bought milk in a bottle at Whole Foods and it was so different than in something in a plastic container. And I used to work at the New England Conservatory and I used to do these you know, events. And I remember uh, you know, making a platter and having different kinds of cheeses. And people actually came to me and said, you know, this really tastes like plastic. Mm. And so, and I also read recently how probably every single one of us has some plastic in our system and it's going to be under our else's. But it really struck me because when I buy my yogurt, for example, I can't find any. I don't know, you know, I, I know they're coming up with better ways to, you know, have a bunch of plastic or whatever, but um, I'm just wondering if that figures into your mm -hmm. idea of green, that whole idea of foods that, I mean, it's amazing that even, you know, I won't mention the name of a store that's supposed to be having, you know, natural products, there's so many things that are happening. Which is going around sharing a minute under our name, where we live, and uh, what brings you here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Clint Richmond. I'm a, a town meeting member here in Brookline for Precinct 6, a member of the Green Caucus of town meeting members, and a uh, lifelong environmentalist. Okay. Thanks for coming. Okay. A quick question. Yes. To what extent is this? Evening to be interactive? Do we pull all our questions at the end or do you entertain them in the middle? Um, I, I would say, like, we're a small group. Let's make it a conversation. Just bring them, as we talk, if you have questions, raise your hand, jump in, throw your body across the floor, whatever. You know, whatever you <laughs> so we'll probably like, present to you the basic ideas in the beginning and then, yeah. and then open so it up. A few minutes so, that, yeah. Okay. So are there four of you on the panel? Or do you want to be on the panel? Great. <laughs> I'm, I'm game if you want. He, he's a pinch hitter. No, he's, he's, let's tell the bench in case one of us passes out. <laughs> no, just three of us. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share what brings me here, and then we're going to talk about the ideas. Um, when I was 19, I just turned 40, when I was 19, I was quite concerned with issues around plastic, specifically styrofoam packaging. Uh, back in San Diego, and uh, at the time, the Montreal, uh, God, I think they were called the Montreal Protocols in 1986, um, international governments had come to an agreement, something that is very difficult for people, or let alone countries, to do, to ban CFCs, fluorofluorocarbons, in uh, first world countries and eventually in developing countries, which uh, were our ozone depleting. So those of you who followed environmental issues back in the 90s, you didn't hear about climate change too much. You didn't hear about greenhouse gases. You heard about ozone depletion. And um, so it's quite miraculous, really, that these countries came together and essentially phased this uh, very dangerous chemical out over, over many years. Um, 
but it was still being used in, in polystyrene film products in the 90s and for a while after, and some um, less destructive, but still destructive uh, replacements. Um, and through that, I became aware, as a college student, um, leaving the nest of my family cooking for me and having to fend for myself at college, what does a young person do? Eats in the cafeteria and eats out quite a bit. And through that firsthand, I became very aware of the waste and very disturbed at the waste. Um, and very disturbed that I was reading news stories as a young adult about ozone depletion and about kids in South America and Australia uh, not being able to go outside and play certain times of the day. And while the whole world's trying to get kids outside and play more, and at the time be on their Atari less and their Nintendo's less, meanwhile, here we were destroying the protective layer uh, called um, the ozone layer, which is three oxygens, and here we were eating it up with these chlorines from chlorofluorocarbons, literally little Pac-Man who were uh, eating away at the oxygen, and taking away the virtual sunscreen that is around this planet, that truly makes life on this planet possible. I thought that was pretty ridiculous. And over what? So we could have polystyrene foam cups? Because we couldn't figure out how to have air conditioners and refrigerators in a more intelligent way? It wasn't really satisfied <clears throat> with those answers. And I thought, here we can put men on the moon, we can create all sorts of wonderful things and destructive things, we can't come up with a different way to create a cup or a refrigerator or air conditioner, and clearly we couldn't. And so what was happening at the time is you had the environmental movement on one side and business on the other side. There wasn't a green building movement. There wasn't much of a green business movement. Um, but there was an environmental movement and a, a rebirth of the environmental movement in 1990. So my thought was, what if those people who cared stopped demonizing those people who are creating the destruction? And those people who are creating the destruction um, were actually given tools and stop being demonized as being bad and not caring about people, which is what was happening. This side was demonizing this side. This side said that side is too naive. And it didn't really get anybody anywhere. So we had the idea of what if we went to the people who were creating the impact and helped them rather than told them what they were doing was bad. Now, thankfully and hopefully, right now, that sounds very boring and very trite and not novel at all, because thankfully, it's not novel now. But in 1990, unfortunately, at that time, there was a big polarity. And so we went to businesses, and we had to explain, one, there's an environmental problem out there, which people didn't know. People didn't know about <coughs> plastic and styrofoam unless you were, you know, crunchy consumer activist, but if you were a business person, it wasn't on your mind. You weren't thinking much about energy efficiency or water efficiency or cleaning chemicals. So in short, we created an organization that would help these business owners, specifically restaurant owners, provide them the tools, the specific solutions from the recycle napkins to the energy efficient equipment to the water efficient equipment from the toilets to the refrigerators, etc. And over the past 22 years, built the largest database of green solutions for the restaurant industry. Um, went from knocking on the doors of college restaurants to now having clients such as the US Treasury, the Federal Reserve, Chase Manhattan, Microsoft, Qualcomm, the most famous restaurant tours for the foodies out there. <coughs> Mario Vitali is a client of ours, as is Eric Repair and Rick Bayless. Um, got a Panera here in town, Baloco, we're in 44 states and Canada. So in short, what we did is created a solution. A solution that would help the businesses make the changes without them needing to become an expert. If you ask the average restaurateur, Jim might be an exception, but we might also be able to stump him too. Ask, ask the average restaurateur the difference between post-consumer waste, pre-consumer waste, total recycled content. S say that again slowly. Exactly. That's exactly my point. Post-consumer waste, pre-consumer waste, total recycled content, um, biodegradable products, oxodegradable products, compostable products, whether the plastics that you see that say made from corn, whether they're really compostable, hopefully I've lost the majority of you in terms of whether you understand these issues. And they go try to find a green cleaning chemical. What are you going to rely on? How many certifications do you know? 
And which ones do you know are valid and which ones do you know are not valid? Is it enough for a cleaning chemical to say that they're green and have a tree on it? Is it enough to have a recycled symbol on the back of the paper that you buy in your office store? These are all questions that the average consumer still has a challenge on. Amen. That, yes. And then take a restaurant tour who has less time than the average consumer who's doing a million things, cooking, cleaning, hiring, firing, and it's very difficult for the average restaurant tour to have the expertise. And so that's what we do is we help restaurants big and small around the country so they don't need to know is that manufacturer saying that they have recycled content but really it's not the best napkin or not? Um, is that cleaning chemical over there for real? It says simple green on it or it says green nature, we love the planet. Is that for real or not? Um, I have to ask you, yes. where did you get your funding to start this organization? Um, we actually didn't. We didn't. We, uh, we, we went, we actually were going to do it for free um, and have a uh, financial model where um, manufacturers were going to pay for it, which actually ended up not being the way it turned out. Um, and went to one of our first restaurants. They said, how much does it cost? They said, it was free. They said, no, 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 no. We're going to pay you for it. So they paid $18. <laughs> um, <laughs> great. Yeah, there you go. Great. Right. And then I said, okay, well, people are paying for it. I went to the next restaurant. I said, $50. He said, no, 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 $100. I said, this is bizarre. You know, people are <laughs> asking to pay from zero to something, from something to more, so that we can help them do something good. This is pretty cool. Um, people are good. And, and so that's how it grew. And, it, you know, and we got beyond just the restaurants that care to, because um, to make a change, you've got to go beyond those who care to the larger world. And we created a series of benefits. And so these restaurants are, um, we've had over 1,000 media hits. We've got our restaurants on CNN, Fox News, NBC Nightly News, Washington Post, um, we, Time Magazine. We even had a soap opera pay us to consult them on a script, Days of Our Lives, it's on our website, to help their fictitious restaurant go green. And um, so we've had, it, it, thankfully, we're in a very different world right now where consumers want this. 79% of consumers want to dine green, but they also want it to be easy. So they can now go on their iPhones and go onto their city search. We have a partnership with City Search, with HopStop. AAA just called us. We're developing a relationship with them. They're going to put it in all their books. Um, so it's something that restaurants want. They want to save money. They want consumers to come. They want to get good media. And some of them actually care about the issue and want the help in making that happen. So to bring it to tonight and um, take that context and why are we all here. So we have restaurants in 44 states in Canada, as I mentioned, both big and small. But they're scattered across the country. And what the consumer really wants is a concentrated group of restaurants in a particular area, which we'll be hearing from Eric. We'll give some more details about that in a moment. And we've created something called a green dining destination, working in Atlanta and Asheville, North Carolina right now, so that those towns and cities can become known as green dining destinations. In other words, enough restaurants in those cities where if you're going there for, for personal, for business, whatever you're doing, you can go stay in a green hotel, you can go rent a hybrid, and you can, in your 10 meals you're going to have there, go to 10 different certified green restaurants. It becomes part of what you can do as a business traveler, as a leisure traveler, or if you live there. And what we're looking to do here is take that a step further and making green dining zones where locals around Boston can see particular neighborhoods starting with Washington Square and have a 25% of the restaurants in this area become certified green restaurants. That's what we're excited to do. We want to, because the more concentrated it is, the more pressure it then creates for the other 75. We've had restaurants who their neighbors across the street, their competitors. We live in a competitive world. And we've seen that Microsoft was the first big corporate campus within a year or two. Chase Manhattan, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, Moody's, Ernst & Young. Do these names evoke, are these the first names you think of when you think of green? No, these are probably the first names you think of when you think about big banking or Fortune 500. Green, different kind of green. Different kind of green, good yeah. point. But Microsoft led the way and Qualcomm and these other companies followed. And this also, too, we've seen on a smaller scale. So that's what we're excited to create right here in Washington Square, not only to create a positive incentive for those other 75, but also other neighborhoods around Boston to do the same and for this to spread, creating green dining zones, 
Eric McNulty. Thank you. And I'm going to take a step back, actually, and talk about food for a minute. Um, I grew up in what I think was a fairly typical American household in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the most used kitchen appliance was not the KitchenAid mixer or the food processor, it was the electric can opener. And, you know, our farmer's market was called Bird's Eye. And fish came frozen, ate to a box, looked like a big USB drive, right? I mean, this was not fine cuisine as we think about it now. Um, fast forward 20 years, when I get out of college in the, in the early 80s and moved to New York and <laughs> had a job where I was lucky to be taken out to lunch a lot, um, I began to learn that oh, asparagus isn't that sort of squishy, fat thing that came out of a can. It's actually a crisp, delicate, bright green, wonderful thing that comes in the spring, and it's got a season. And the fish is fresh over sole, or it's salmon in the air. Or, you know, and thank goodness corporate America was paying for this. I never could have, but I learned a lot. I began to learn a lot about food and appreciate, much more appreciate food. And all the flavors, the seasons, the intricacies of it. And... That, I, as I thought about it, is sort of emblematic of what's happened to our food system in this country. We've gotten really good at one end of having the best of the best, anything, anytime, at whatever price. You can walk into Whole Foods in February and get organic raspberries, or you expect to. And at the other end, we've gotten really good at producing boatloads of empty calories that are cheap. You know, you can get the cheapest hamburger, you can get the cheapest donut, you can buy a lot of junk for not a lot of money, or you can spend a lot of money to get things nice. Um, what I think we need is to have an abundant, healthy food supply that's affordable for as many people as possible. We need to kind of bring those two together, the, the knowledge of how to do food in, in ways that are as affordable, but also be able to do it with, with high quality. And so I wanted to bring those two together. Um, I've been working on environmental issues for a long time. I was for many years sort of a passive environmentalist. I would talk about it, I would occasionally make a choice that was environmentally sensitive, but for the most part, no. You know, I, again, I would not go to great lengths. Um, food, I came to realize, is something we all eat generally three times a day, maybe four, depending on how much you snack. Um, we do it every day, so the more conscious you become about your food choices, the more conscious you become about all your choices, and you can think about it. And so. I began to investigate the idea of a, of a green restaurant zone, uh, in part inspired by Jim, who I had met at a neighborhood fair and found that he was the first certified green restaurant in Boston. Talked about that and learned what that was. Um, I was tasked through a class I was taking at Leslie College at coming up with a, uh, rather than just writing about uh, sustainability, which is what I do most of the time for a day job, write about leadership issues in this area, climate change, to actually doing something. And so came up with the idea of what if we got more than just Jim to do this and went and talked to Michael and we realized that Washington Square, and I don't mean this to be a proprietary idea for Washington Square for those of you who live in other places, but we do have in a, tw in a two block span 20 restaurants, 20 built businesses that sell food in some form for eat in or take out. Uh, it's about a third of the total businesses in that two block area and if you walk day or night it's got a food vibe. We have outdoor seating which a lot of Brookline does not. Everywhere you look in that two blocks, you see restaurants. So it's, it's what Washington Square has become about. It's not as diverse as Coolidge Corner. And so we said, what can we do there? And in talking to Michael and learning that the economic benefits of the restaurant, they save money. I knew the environmental benefits of um, going at this in a way that you could, you could save, conserve uh, energy, you could reduce waste, and produce healthier food. It seemed like a great marriage. So we cooked up with the idea. We're in the process of doing it. Jim is the first one to certify before I started. More recently, Umami and Athens have agreed to begin the certification process. And we are hoping with consumer pressure, because it's going to happen bottom up, not top down, um, to get two more restaurants in the, in the square to do this, to get the, the, the uh, zone status. And then I'm really hoping that the village steals the idea, and Coolidge Corner steals the idea, and St. Mary steals the idea. I want everybody to steal the idea. I want green food trucks pulling into the neighborhoods when we have food trucks. Um, this is, as Jim has said, not something about competitive advantage. It's about showing that it can work, showing that consumers care about it, and then spreading it as far as we can. So that's where we're going to jump off. Jim, I'll turn it back to you, and then we'll start answering questions. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I'm Jim Solomon. I own the fireplace, um, and uh, I did not open the restaurant with the intention 
of being green. Um, I, uh, I did open the intent with the intention of buying uh, locally, of buying from local farmers and fishermen and, um, you know, supporting the local economy. Um, and, uh, you know, my restaurant was inspired um, and sort of the love of what's local um, by being a 10-year-old living in Lincoln uh, during the bicentennial and um, learning about colonial America in school during that year, as you know, I think many New England school children did, as well as across the country, but I think probably particularly in the 13 states. And um, we really did in our school. And um, um, without going into it all, well, we, the night before, um, the, by the actual bicentennial, um, April 19th, we stayed at a teacher's home and we dressed up in colonial garb, uh, you know, as best as we could. And we learned um, some of the type of cooking that was done back then and some of the games that were played. And then we woke up very early in the morning and we traced the route that Paul Revere took from Lincoln into Concord. And we ended up at the Old North Bridge and uh, we were at the front of the line, I mean, the crowd, because we were so little. Um, and we saw the reenactment of the shot heard around the world. Um, and um, we uh, saw President Ford came, and uh, there were just thousands of Minutemen from all over. Um, it was really, you know, uh, it was overwhelming. and. Um, you know, I became, I was so moved by it all. And, you know, we were reading Johnny Tremaine in school. And, you know, um, I, I was just so caught up in the whole thing that I spent the next about 35 years reading about indigenous ingredients, wrought iron cooking, wood cook, wood burning um, cooking, and, um, and developed a great sense of pride for for this place that I live, for New England. Um, and the manifestation of that, that love, um, you know, is, has been the creation of the fireplace. Um, so we celebrate the bounty of New England and we buy from local farmers and fishermen and serve what's fresh and in season. So that's sort of how we were born. Um, um, and then um, uh, I got one day a letter um, in the mail. It might have been a postcard, but it said, do you want to have a green restaurant? And I thought, well, I think so. I don't really know what that is. But, you know, uh, I, I do remember living in Cambridge as a young kid and, um, um, and you know, we're a pretty liberal family, and I remember very well, those of you, you know, my age or, you know, around thereabouts or older will remember the commercial with the Indian and the tear. Um, and I remember, uh, for those of you who don't know, the um, Indian, you know, um, coming up to the ledge and what looks like a beautiful, a beautiful scenic place and then looking over and down in the valley where there's smokestacks and pollution and it was really sad and, and you see the tear come down in its face and I was so moved by that, you know, and I just wanted to do what I could to fight pollution. Um, and uh, so, you know, I knew a little bit more than that and um, so when I got this postcard I thought, well that's certainly something I, I'd like to investigate. And so we got hold of um, the company that, or the, the organization that had sent this. And uh, they were out in California and it said the Green Restaurant Association. And so um, I had someone 
make an initial phone call for me and do some screening, and they said, yeah, I think these guys sound legit. And so then I got on the phone with Michael and, um, you know, was impressed and uh, very interested. And, um, you know, the, va my, the values meshed, and I thought, that's great. I would like to also be ecologically responsible. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I always learned about corporate responsibility as a kid, and I always believed in it. And then it sort of dawned on me that, hey, I am a corporation now. You know, I mean, for the most part, um, I guess it's it's my time to participate and do my part. You know, and you know, help my community, um, uh, pull my weight. Um, and so I eagerly started to find out more about what this was all about. And, um, you know, I, and I went in with some trepidation because as Michael, um, you know, was alluding to, uh, the life of restaurateurs, uh, it's a very busy life. Um, uh, you know, we all, we all work hard. Um, the, you know, you know, I think that because it's a seven day a week business and it's often for us lunch and dinner and brunch you know um, and live music and holidays it's it's really demanding and so um, I was worried that I wouldn't have the time to devote to learning about the issues and then taking action and I was also concerned uh, about the financial end of it you know, is this going to cost me a lot of money? Um, you know, will I be a really good citizen, but I'll go broke doing it? Yeah, exactly. You know, or is it something where, you know, there is a payback, but the payback's really far out there, and the life of an average restaurant's pretty short, and I may just not realize that payback? Um, you know, I wasn't really sure, but I was um, interested enough to, to learn more anyway. And so um, what I've been um, really pleased to learn is that the Green Restaurant Association um, will come to your restaurant and walk the um, site with you and give you a laundry list of changes that you can make. And then um, what they're primarily concerned with is that you move in the right direction. Um, and they're very understanding that, um, you know, there are, there's a lot of financial pressure on restaurateurs to, you know, it's very difficult to stay alive in this business. And, um, and you know, like I said, the time that we have is really limited. Um, either to action or to, you know, our own personal education on these issues. And so um, what I was so impressed about with the Green Restaurant Association is, you know, they thought it was great that I, you know, that our values aligned and that I really wanted to do the right thing. But um, they, well, they were, um, you know, willing, able, and eager to step forward and make, um, the financial case for um, why many of these changes were just smart business decisions. Um, so that was really reassuring at first. Um, and then they said, um, we also know you're super busy, so don't worry, you don't need to learn about any of these issues. You know, you can if you'd like. You know, we love this stuff and we'll, we'll talk to you about them. And, We'll help educate you, but don't worry. If you're too busy, we just care that you're moving in the right direction. And so that took a load off my mind uh, because um, I was just worried that I, I just couldn't master all these green subjects, you know, uh, even though I, I'd love the time to devote to more article reading and, and the like, like, like we all would. Um, and so they were comfortable being the experts and showing me financially why uh, different steps were viable. And then they even said with regard to uh, the action that we needed to take, even if that action was pretty simple, like calling an electrician to come and put in fixtures, or calling NSTAR first to come in, do an, an energy audit, 
um, and make some recommendations, uh, you know, and then getting the electrician to come and maybe put switches on that switch lights off, um, you know, after a certain amount of time and, um, you know, maybe some light bulbs had to be ordered. Um, they said, don't worry, we can do all that for you. So they got a hold of NSTAR and arranged for them to come by. They found an electrician, had them come in, you know, and they took care of the ordering of the light bulbs and, um, you, know, let, you know, let us know of a rebate that we could get. Um, I think it wasn't even a rebate. It was, we didn't even have to put the money out. What do you call that? A, uh, pay? Up front uh, incentive. Rebate. incentive. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, it was subsidized basically um, that, you know, I think our first purchase of light bulbs was, you know, it was like $1,200 of light bulbs. And I think we had to pay about $240 or so, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. And I just thought, you know, wow, I mean, I couldn't spend the larger sum, but, you know, a couple hundred bucks I can justify. And um, so that's basically, that basically characterized how I've been able to work, God, God bless you, with bless you. the Green Restaurant Association. It's been so sort of user friendly for me that it's made the whole process, you know, not only painless, but, you know, really exciting, you know, because I'm doing, you know, I can look in the mirror and know that I'm, um, I'm doing what I should be by my community, by the planet, you know, um, by the values I learned at home. And uh, so that's basically how the relationships worked. Um, you know, I'll give a little bit more history before turning it back over, opening it up. Um, in Brookline, um, well, yeah. um, so, you know, we have been the first certified green restaurant now for seven seven years. Uh, they were the first in the first for seven years um, in, in the Boston, metropolitan Boston area, um, and have successfully. Uh, I've called on other high-profile restaurateurs in Boston that have um, made the decision to become certified green restaurants, and there's you know a handful of them now. Um, I've had no luck in Brookline, and. That's upsetting um, to me because I would love to see it. Yeah. There's two restaurants that have well, signed up. They're getting well. They're getting their agent they're they're just now. Yeah. They're, 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 they, you know, they, they express they, interest. They've agreed to yeah. meet with us. Yeah. Oh. Right. They've agreed to. So it's a little so far from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, um, you know. It, and those two, uh, I'm very proud of, and I, I tell everybody that they showed up, and, and there's one other, actually. Um, so I started trying to erase my competitive advantage because, you know, like it was said earlier, I'm, you know, I think um, by Eric, uh, you know, I'm just showing, trying to show that it can be done and not retain a competitive advantage. And so, um, um, you know, Michael has worked with me on outreach. And like I said, we were successful in Boston. In Brookline, um, Michael sent some of his people out in the street to ask a really basic question. You know, if, um, I think I have this paraphrasing basically correctly, you know, uh, if a restaurant were a certified green restaurant, would you frequent it, would you frequent it more? Um, and, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, the answer was sure, absolutely. Um, so we tried to take some of that information and then um, put that out to the local restaurants. And um, you know, I reached out to some. Michael reached out to quite a few, and we met at town hall. And um, you know, I arranged a room, and we contacted a lot of restaurants. And three restaurants came: um, Umami. Lineage and the fireplace. So that was pretty discouraging. Um, uh, some time went by, you know, several months. You know, Eric came to me about um, creating a green restaurant zone, and so we tried to pull people together again and concentrate just on Washington Square. And so um, 
myself and one of my managers personally contacted pretty much every restaurant in Washington Square. Although I think we missed the Indian place, and I bet they would have come. It's a great restaurant. Uh, but that, I don't want them to be faulted. Um, and um, the only restaurants that came, um, despite people saying, you know, I'll, hey, I'll be there, that sounds great, there were three, Umami, Athens, and the fireplace. And um, so that was really discouraging. This had already been planned. So, uh, you know, I went to the woman who runs Brookline Adult Ed and said, look, let's put this thing together and let's try a different approach uh, because I'm having trouble. Nobody seems to want to do it or want to even learn about it um, from the restaurant community in town. So what my hope was that um, that people uh, would come and we could start sort of a grassroots movement. And I didn't want to call on people to boycott those restaurants. I wanted to call on people to just express to the different restaurant owners and managers, hey, you know what, I would frequent your restaurant more often if you were a more ecologically responsible business or I saw that you were really moving in that direction. And, and that's really just what I want to soften the ground. Um, and that after a while, you know, if that, since after six months, if there's no movement, you know, then for people to start to consider voting with their feet. So that's, that's sort of where it stands right now. You know, and with that, I can turn it over and open it up. Well, let's open it up. I want to, I want to go back to a couple of questions that were asked earlier as a way to start this. Because I think that one of the good things about the certification is you know the back of the house is taken care of. I mean, as a diner, you can do certain things, but you can't change the light bulb. You can't change the put low, 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 uh, low flow valves in the dishwasher. Yeah, the back of the house is the kitchen area for right. those I mean, that don't know. Yeah. The, um, a typical restaurant uses about two and a half times the energy of, a, of, another, of another storefront business. That you can use as much as 300,000 gallons of water a year to generate about 50,000 pounds of waste. Um, so they're very ecologically intensive. And so this back of the house stuff can help a lot, that a lot. I mean, you can, about, they estimate about 95% of Restaurant waste can either be recycled or composted, um, is one example. What you can do as a diner, and whether you're at a green restaurant, you're at home, you're wherever you are, um, I think the, the thing that makes the most impact is eat less meat. Um, I remember reading an article in the New York Times, opened my eyes, it said if you, eat, if you have one more meatless meal per day, it's like going from driving a Toyota Camry to driving a Prius, in terms of your, what, your carbon impact. It's dramatic impact, meat production, uh, produces about 18% of the overall um, greenhouse gases produced in this country every year. So eat less meat is, is the thing you can do. You can do it as you do it at home. You can ask the restaurant tours to have more vegetarian options, um, certainly, to do that. Um, the second thing is eat organic um, because, the, the, again, the food production is much more intensive. The uh, synthetic fertilizers in particular that are used on a lot of mass-grown uh, corn and soybeans and things out in the, in the Midwest uh, 300 times the greenhouse gas impact is carbon dioxide. It's enormous. It's a dead zone in the Gulf because of the nitrogen that, that washes down the Mississippi from the, the, mat, the farms in the Midwest. So if you look for organic, and, and a, for a vegetable, about 83% of its carbon footprint is based on how it was grown, but 11% is where it's grown, is it local or is it far away, and the balance is how is it packaged. So looking for organic is, is cause it, you know, the question a lot, actually, Anne had asked it and then she had to leave, was um, do I think about, how do I think about local versus organic? And organic has a much bigger impact than local. I still want you to go to the farmer's market and buy local. If you can buy local and organic, best of all worlds, um, and places like Jim that, that, that serve local and organic, um, that really helps. So uh, from, with that, let's turn it over to questions and start a discussion. Yes? Yeah, you know, I just listening to you, it, just from my point of view, going to the restaurants, trying to get them involved, it's kind of a top-down approach, you know? I mean, you have to think about, this, this has to be a consumer driven kind of a... That's what we want, that's all I am. That's, that's what it's got to be, is consumer driven, because that will change the behavior of everyone else. And so, but a couple things. One, first, I'm not sure everybody knows what green 
mean. So if, if, if you walk up to someone on the street and you say, you want to go green? Well, who knows what that means, you know? I mean, maybe you've got to find some language that that's a little more direct for the consumer. Um, and the second thing is, is that in this community, never underestimate the power of the schools and the children in the school. So I would recommend an educational campaign at that level, you know, because that will really, just like, you know, when I grew up, which is years and years ago, the anti-smoking thing went on in the schools and the kids came home and told their parents this is what we want you know and that made a huge difference and in this community children carry a lot of weight and if you could get some stuff going on in the schools I think it could be very very useful right I'm actually um, working with Sonia Elder uh, who yes. runs the school a terrific, um, lady. Uh, terrific woman um, and um, I approached her um, to start a dialogue when, when she first started and um, uh, and have since gone to her with um, a helpful vending machine option to get the current vending machines out of the schools and the helpful uh, products in. And there's a company that um, I'm working with a woman who I met through Bountiful Brookline who turned me on to this company and uh, their, their product line is just really fabulous. Um, so we've got that discussion going. Um, and I'm also bringing her in a few weeks to Harvard. Um, I asked her if she would come with me to hear Jamie Oliver speak on um, helpful, um, you know, helpful school lunches and some of the differences between what's going on in England and the United States. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I am trying to, to work that, that route also. And, and um, in it, the classroom as well. I mean, mm -hmm. to get into the curriculum. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, really sure. important on, on a lot of different levels in the curriculum. Yeah. That's a good point. Something on, on the marketing, we commissioned a survey by a company called Technomic, which is the most reputable survey company in the restaurant industry. And they did 500 people around the country. Um, and people's awareness now is very different than it, where it was five years ago in terms of terms like green. 79% of people across the United States stated a preference towards um, certified green restaurant. And there was actually a question if you have three favorite restaurants in your neighborhood and one of them became a certified green restaurant, um, how would that affect you or would it? 25% said it would not. 10% said that they would walk, they would use their feet, and they would singularly now go to the certified green restaurant and stop going to the other two. 65% said that they wouldn't stop going to the other two. They would just diminish their consumption of the other two and increase. So you've got 25% who don't care, 10% who care quite a bit and are willing to take, make some big moves, and you have the 65% in the middle, mainstream America, who, if it's easy, might not make a 100% commitment, but will make an increasing commitment. So those were really encouraging numbers, and those actually reflect in various different marketing surveys. And then, as Jim mentioned, we got some nice uh, volunteers who uh, went out for a week or two um, and got 2,000 signatures in the Brookline area. Um, saying that they would prefer, they would actually give strong preference towards going to certified green restaurants uh, in the Brookline area. So we have a lot behind us between Jim as a restaurateur, Eric as an academic, as an activist, the Green Restaurant Association as a national organization that happens to be based right here in, in downtown. Um, there really is a lot of convergence of, of the possibility of making this region, specifically Washington Square, the first green dining zone. The one thing that's missing, we've got a whole box of matches. And we even have a fire. We have Jim's one restaurant that's kindling. And, and all of us trying to spread that fire. But as you mentioned, I could sit there and talk to a restaurateur. And I can make the best case. I can introduce them to a Jim. I can introduce them to a Mario Batali. I can they can say, I'm just a hot dog stand. I can show them a hot dog stand and say, well, this is what they did. They're saving this money. They got on TV. Did you get on TV recently? Did you save $3,000 doing this? I don't say it like this, but I'm basically making a case. But none of that, none of that is as valuable as the consumer. 
And so we have something on our site, I encourage you to write this down, on dinegreen.com. You go to... Is that your website? Yeah, that's our website, yeah. dinegreen.com. We have, I have samples here, I printed out, You have too, samples. The ah, will you grab them and show people? Yeah. They're these little coupons that next time you go out to eat, they're not like a discount coupon. I guess they're like an emotional discount, if you will. They make you feel good. Um, you leave them with your tip. Those are they. They look like little dollars. And next time you go out to eat, you leave a tip. It has to be a generous tip, because if you don't leave a generous tip, they won't listen to your environmental suggestion. But the, the card basically says, I care about the environment. I'd really prefer if your restaurant, it's, it's very non-confrontational. I'd really prefer if your restaurant becomes uh, more environmentally sustainable, and we'd like to see you become a certified green restaurant. And I have to say, in 1994, we got our first volunteer. And I was living in La Jolla, California, half a block from the beach in San Diego, and didn't have an office for the volunteer to come to. So they came to my house. And what did they do at the time? This is, you know, pre-internet. I mean, there's a little bit of email going on. Um, he started making phone calls. And, you know, he started calling the restaurants that he likes. Hey, I'm a consumer. I go to your Indian restaurant. I go here. I go here. I'd love for you to become a certified green restaurant. At the time, there was no caller ID. There, nobody had cell phones. They was calling from my home phone, which was also my business phone at the time. He was so effective that he hung up, and within a few minutes, the one restaurant that he had just called, this Indian restaurant that I, rem I remember, I don't know if it's still there, called up and said, I just got a call from a consumer. I care about these issues. My consumer cares, I guess. What do you guys do? And they became a certified green restaurant. And I love that example. I rarely tell, the, tell that story. But it just shows one guy making a phone call was enough to get this restaurant owner to listen. And here's this guy who cared. He was, he was a volunteer. He was like all of us here spending his time. He didn't need to do this. So it's just a nice thing to remember. You know, when I, sometimes when I give a speech in a larger, a larger venue, I ask people, when you go out to eat, do you wear a t-shirt that says, uh, I care about the environment? I, I'll ask you guys. Do you guys wear a t-shirt that says, I care about the environment? Anybody? When you go out to eat? No. Do you guys wear a hat? Do you guys wear pins? No? Okay, there you go. Maybe if you had one, you would wear one. But um, most people don't. We don't wear it on our sleeve. Yet, we're all here today. We, 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 must, we must care more than that 25% who doesn't care at all. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And if more restaurateurs or grocery stores or whomever that we patronize knew what we cared about in a nice, respectful way, they would act. That is the biggest, biggest missing piece. Consumers have an incredible power. So I'm confident, even though you know, it's a slow kindling fire, I'm confident that at some point in a month, in two months, in six months, in a year, I'm not sure, there will be a green dining zone. And I'm confident it will come somewhat from presentations like this, but it will come more from you guys. What's that? Will you come out and offer green t-shirts? Yeah, if that's what it that's takes. What it that's what it takes. Yes, sir. You have a tremendous job because not only have you to uh, educate restaurateurs, but you've got to educate the clients. Right. And I came here and I know nothing. Right. And if I'm going to wear a green shirt, right. I'll give a card or something. I'll get to know what I'm talking about. Right. And I'm right. going to Great. Quick course. On dyinggreen.com, upper right-hand corner, your 30-minute free course. Push the education section. You could read on energy. You could find great stats like the restaurant industry is the largest consumer for electricity, you know, can produce 50,000 to 100,000 pounds. You can come up with some things that really will, you know, you're not going to remember all of it, but enough to be impressive. So I encourage you to go to the education section because you can become green, quite educated. Dine, dine, dine dine green. Green. Com. You take, you take one of the samples that has the coupons, the web, websites on the, uh, right on there. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can find a resource for some green cotton t-shirts and make them available and people can purchase them from your website. Yes. And, you know, that and you know, have that you turn with the business together. things right. on the back that, you know, we want you to save 100 Gallons of water tonight. Right. Whatever. Right. Recycle all your plastic. Yeah. Use the low flow toilets, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good idea. It's good stuff. I do, I do think that, that I mean, there is um, just one more point before we move on to the next question, which is that as activists, one of the things we are doing, which is kind of fun, we just did our first one last night, was just a neighborhood dine around. 
we got eight people together, we went out to dinner. Just neighbors out having dinner, we went to Umami to thank them for, for showing the interest in the green restaurant. We're going to try and do one a month. If you'd like to be on the invitation list for that, just make sure I get your information before we leave. We'll send it out. Come when you can. Don't when you can. And it just it was just, again, talking around the neighborhood, people saying, I'd like an excuse to go out and, and meet more neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to go and exercise our power. And we say why we're there. We eat, we drink, we have fun, and then we go home. So it's a good way to support the business and support the cause. Excellent. But there's a lot to, to, to know. I mean, we are 70% of the counties in this country are under threat of drought. Um, the changes that are coming with the weather because of climate change are going to have a severe impact on our food supply and what, what we grow, what we eat, very much around the world. We're actually in better shape here than a lot of parts of the world. Um, but this idea that we're going to be able to have everything bountiful all the time is going to be very, very, it's going to change a lot in the next couple of decades. So the more we get used to changing things now, the more we can um, have a normalized, healthy, abundant, fun life. An, an exciting thing before we get to the next question is we're in an in a incredible era because we have this incredible challenge, but we're not in this gap period of not having the answers. Not having the what? We, we're not in this period of not having the answers. So for example, I just got solar power, so, solar power on my home after six years of researching it. We're completely not using nuclear power, coal, large hydro, natural gas. We're, we're completely clean. We're overproducing. We're sending it to our neighbors. Six years ago, we were in a gap of, gosh, I really wish I could do this, but just financially it wasn't there, technologically. So we're really in a place where restaurants can reduce. You know, 10 years ago, composting commercially was not available very much, unless you were in San Francisco about six or seven years ago. Now if you're in Boston, DC, LA, New York, our restaurants can reduce their waste by 95%. LED lighting was an exciting bulb that I held 11 years ago that was going to last seven or eight years and have no mercury and reduce the energy consumption by 90%. There were great things that you could read about in popular science, but it wasn't available in a way that you could really purchase it. Now, we have some restaurants going all LED, and their payback is in a year or two, and there's financing, and sometimes the payback is in a month because of the financing. So solar is here. 90% reduction in lighting is here, reducing waste by 95%. So we're in a time where the problems are great, but in terms of education, the solutions are really here, and it's just a matter of marrying those two together and allowing those restaurateurs to know that and having the consumer compel the restaurateurs to want to know that. More questions. We actually did the Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, where the president gets his checkup. Um, so we have done hospitals. We've done. We have Harvard. We have Northeastern. So we've done all sorts of institutional settings. They're the same. They're yeah. So so we've done um, Bethesda Naval Medical Center, a, a okay. hospital. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, we have done healthcare facilities. Um, and the problems are exactly the same as they are for, they're 99% the same across the board, whether it's at a Harvard, a hospital, a secondary school, um, a corporate cafeteria. So, you know, there are nuances, um, but uh, the, the problems are all solvable, whether it's what do we do for packaging, how do we have it still be sterile and, and clean. Um, there's, there's definitely great solutions. Like the budgets would be which makes it all, so if I, was, if, if I was in a business meeting with the CFO, I'd say all the more reason to do this. Because although certain things are going to cost you more, yeah. if you don't have all LED lighting in your cafeteria, you're throwing money away. If you are paying fully for your garbage and are not recycling and composting, then you are likely throwing money away. We have restaurants here in Boston. Um, I could say who they are. Baloco, we did an education program for them. And uh, they're projecting many thousands of dollars per location savings via recycling and composting. So the arguments flipped. It used to be, oh, I want to do something good, but I don't know if I have the money. Right. Now I have the gall to say to restaurateurs, you don't have the money, then you can't afford not to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can't afford, depending upon what business you are, to throw that electricity money away, the water money away, the waste money away, sometimes the package money away, but also liability. Do you as a restaurateur want to have three different chemicals on the premises that somebody who might not understand that warning or that language can mix together and even have a one in a hundred chance of ending up in a 
hospital. I guess if they were in a hospital, it'd be more convenient. But you know, you don't want you don't want that liability. And these are the things that really make a strong business case. And also, 70% of people prefer working at a business that's a certified green restaurant. We have great feedback from many of our restaurants. I just spoke to a restaurant recently who said 50% of his employees are there because it's a certified green restaurant. So what does that do to productivity, to honesty, to loyalty, to not showing up late? How does that affect the business? How does that make the managers and CFOs happier? So. Yes. Even though you have made your point about LED lighting and how much that's going to change. I mean, look at the savings that Jim had right there on his LED lighting, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think the perception is still prevalent. The perception yeah. that the perception that going green is more expen more expensive is prevalent. It's less prevalent than it used to be, but it's still quite prevalent. Um, usually when I can take that two minute spiel that I just gave to you and expand it and really break the numbers down and, and say, okay, you know, I could hear the restaurateur say, well, I hear about those LEDs, but I can't afford two years. And they would say, understandable, they are expensive, and two years for many restaurateurs is a long time, but hey, there's this company over there, we'll finance it for you. So you're going to save $300 in the first month, but you're going to pay them $200. You have a net of 100 How does that sound to you, to save $100 from day one? So one by one to kind of pop those little balloons. And then eventually, they come to, oh, wow, all those concerns are not there. Um, I can't go fully organic. I can't go fully vegetarian because everybody loves my steak. So I said, great, don't become fully vegetarian. But maybe mark your vegetarian options better. Maybe offer a couple more. Maybe you can't go organic in your steak, but maybe test one out. Don't get rid of your current one. Test one out. That's organic. Charge a dollar or two more. Test it out. See if people like it. So there's all sorts of different ways that are not threatening for them to, to go. It's not an all or nothing game. If it was an all game, every restaurateur, first of all, there'd be no certified green restaurants if our standards were you have to go fully vegan, because as you mentioned, that's the lowest on the, on, the, on the food chain, the biggest environmental impact, fully solar powered, um, growing all your food on your rooftop. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So our standards are geared towards, we have two, three, and four stars. And the two-star level is really a level that restaurateurs can do. It's significant in terms of the impact, but it's very um, doable without it being disruptive and having those concerns be realized. It's a chain like um, a local side, um, taking independent restaurants, yeah. not chains. Are you finding it's more uh, fine dining, you know, the Mary Batali's, the Eric Rickards? It's all over. The, the, all over. And is it the pizza parlor? It is. The local pizza parlor. It is. is I, sort of I just mentioned the famous ones and the big ones right, because, because people... It's fun to throw those names around, isn't it? It's fun to throw them around, but it, it gets people to realize a lot of people have the conception it's just the crunchy small restaurant. It's, it's that vegetarian restaurant that's doing it. And so we like to mention the names and the big guys. They go, oh, wow. This, if they're doing it, it must make business sense because... Right. It gives your organization a lot more the credibility, because if we're all just vegetarian restaurants, then everybody would just say, well, of course, there's the people that care. But when they see right. a restaurant that they wouldn't normally think of as green doing this, right. you have to have that conception of, well, maybe this does make financial sense. Maybe this is good for PR. Maybe the employees really do care. And so you get, you get both. You have the small hot dog place. You have a small pizza place and the big. It's really, right. when, I, when I'm interviewed, one of the, that's a common question I get. And, and I don't give the answer the reporters like. They want to hear you know, a specific segment, and we don't have that. What I say is it's personality driven. It's Jim, who um, is going to be the type of person that's going to be the person to grab this first and be a leader. And that's also true with the Microsoft. So it's more, I would say, personality based and leadership based rather than the type of restaurant still at this point. Or it's Jim's done it, and now then you get the second f phase of the competitor across the street needs to do it because. Jim is doing it. So that's also what's happened across the country. And I would say, I, I'm, I'm everyone here, but I'm, I'm an unrepentant, unrepentant omnivore. So I'm, I'm not a vegan. I don't plan to be one anytime soon. But I have made certain things. I do try and eat two vegetarian meals a day, inspired by Mark Bittman, who does two vegan meals a day, which he did for health reasons and worked out very well. But I, again, 
came to the vegan thing, but I've gotten two, roughly two vegetarian meals. I've gone to all only eating grass-fed beef and, and lamb, and which then I found there's a couple of things. One, it makes you think about where you're eating. It directs you, does direct you to certain restaurants. I can tell you between Brookline and, and Harvard Square, where my office is, everybody who has a grass-fed burger, uh, and which ones are good, which ones are not so good. So it really does begin to make choice. But those simple things that make you conscious of the choice you're making, there's still lots of options. You don't have to give up everything. You can still eat lots of great food. You can have lots of good choices. But by beginning to think about the certain drivers of impact, you wind up actually think with better food. You, I wind up eating less meat, for example, because I made that decision, which is <coughs> a personal decision. But there are ways you can check that impact. And so, and the restaurants that you, know, you will see it now in the menu, and it does. It is the independence. It is if you like your burritos. If you don't go to Boloco, you go to Chipotle, where they have are very much now about sustainable agriculture, sustainable meat production, those kinds of things. So it's getting easier and easier to make the impact and not have to be a fringe what person. What about hospital cafeterias? I'm going to go over to Mass General and have an appointment tomorrow. And I'm always struck when I go over there, terrible thing. Oh, my terrible. God. I mean, the, 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 the use of plastics and styrofoam and trays, everything. And, and I almost can't make a tray. I mean, they, they want you to throw it in a barrel, not a separate barrel, which is going to recycle, just in with everything else. And yeah. so Mm -hmm. yeah. But it seems to me that, that hospitals should be a leader in terms of education. I think hospitals are geared to, because they're, they're getting rid of so much toxic waste, they're geared to throw everything away. Yeah. Use it and throw it. You know, the, the Johnny, the, the syringe, and the, the, the food container. It needs to change. It could be very different, as Michael said, with, with commercial composting now available. I've, I've begun doing some work when I do events with a uh, catering company on the North Shore, and they do zero waste events. And they do all sort of organic food, but they also do the, the flatware, the plates, the napkins. Everything is either recycled or composted. I don't know if you were the guys who came up to Rotary's Pancake Breakfast this year. We had these on green. You no, know, I love a pancake breakfast, and so i got to find out about that. We screamed about it because it was three days right. before the event, but Jonathan talked no. about that too. We, we served about 1,500 people at the Pancake Breakfast since the first year. Mary Dewart is the one who crashed. It went green and it went well. You know? Right. So you yeah. got in. But you know, in an event like that, or the farmer's market, it seems to me, you, know, you can make it really simple for the consumers to get this information. I, I would think somebody would be sitting there with these little coupons that you know people can take with the information on the back. Two steps is too many for most people. You have to yeah. go to the website and look it up. Forget about it. Put this in your purse. Next time you go out to eat, hand it to them. Sure. You know? Come to the pancake breakfast next year. You can hand those things out. That's a great idea. You hand them out at the farmer's market. You don't make too many steps. Sure. You know, I'd like to piggyback on what you said because um, there was a, a professor I heard years ago. I can't remember his name, unfortunately. But he said to be an environmentalist is to, to care about these issues is to both be a harbinger of doom and a purveyor of hope um, at the same time. You've got to feel the pain um, of these issues. If you don't feel the pain of these issues, then who cares? If you don't understand that uh, you know, air pollution is a big issue and is one of the main reasons children go to hospitals, and you don't understand climate change or ozone depletion um, or energy issues or why water is important, if you don't understand even a little bit, you don't have to be that educated, but just understand a little bit, then, then there's not a big reason to choose that certified green restaurant. But thankfully, in the I, I what's that? Put that slogan on your right. I have to I have to find the professor and get his uh, get permission. That. But then you also have to be a purveyor of hope, at yeah, the same hope. time, because if you're too much doom and gloom, Nobody will do it. then then you become depressed and the issues are too big. And <laughs> so, right. Which which is why it's great when you have the example of the hospital and the food truck just juxtaposing. You, you have to look at the low-hanging fruit. So what I would say in this conversation is the ho that hospital is not the first one we'd go after. You know, there's, other, there, there's probably 70 other businesses and institutions are that much closer and ready to make the change. Let them make the change because what that does is two years from now, the hospital can go get those LED lights because these people all bought them and they went from $20 down to 15 and now the payback instead of being two years is one year. And the so... Trustees have now all got them in their house you got it. 
You got it. So you always, we always have to go for, for the, the biggest possibility, and the others will come. But if you just go to, you go to the worst ones, it's depressing, and they won't move. Right. You know, what, and what are you doing in the cafeteria? What are the, what's all this wastefulness? Mm. Absolutely. That's where, you know, you gotta, I mean, you don't want to be a victim. Right. Right. We do have one, one uh, home, f uh, we have a, a, a old age home on the west coast called Age Song, you could take a look at. So there, there's, there, yeah, Age Song. 50 years ago, I used to buy cases of beer in bar bottles that went back and they got right. washed and refilled. Now, I did that because I thought that was good for the environment. Sure. I can't do that. Right. Why is that? Well, I mean, you could still do it. There's a few milk bottles that you could still do that with. It's come back. But by and large, we've shifted, whether it's the milk or the beer, um, from an economy, a reusable economy to a disposable economy, unfortunately. So it is reduce, reuse, recycle, but the best that we have in our economy most of the time is recycling and composting. It's very difficult even to go to a great place like Whole Foods and have a, a reusable, you can't, if you, unless you're getting produce. If you're getting anything packaged in metal or glass, it's at best going to be recycled. That's a much larger question, whether if it will ever shift back to the distributors, taking that back and sending it back to the manufacturers, whether that will happen again, is uh, is unclear, but um, it's definitely the best thing. Is reusing. is it genuinely true that that was environmentally more sound? Well, I mean, w what was environmental and frugal were completely intertwined. During World War II, the amount of recycling and reuse and conservation that was happening in this country was this because of some great altruistic environmental ethic. No, it's because there was a huge war effort. Resources were finite, and the whole country had to rally around that. And, and that's why you had an ethic of people of that generation who were more likely to reuse than 15 or 20 years later. Of course, that was my generation. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so it's shifted, unfortunately. Now people throw things away and well, have... I haven't have, shifted. Well, good, don't <laughs> shift. I've, I've been left behind. Bring, no, bring, <laughs> bring us back. Bring us back. Bring us back. I, bring I us tell back. you, my grandmother told me that their dog was fed on table scraps. They never bought dog food. If I had a dog, it would starve <laughs> if I had to feed it on table scraps. Right. <laughs> we, we eat all our food. Right, good food. Yeah. Right. I, right. You go to a restaurant and you see these enormous portions yeah. and you see enormous food going yeah. back to about, the kitchen. About 25% of that is wasted. It looks to me like more, more yeah. like fifty percent. Yeah, I, I see an awful lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Is your progress in the gym of small portions, or do people really expect? Expect. Um, the difficulty with um, that, I think, from a restaurant tourist standpoint, um, is. You know, it's kind of, it's, it, it, well, it's an interesting problem. It's, um, you know, we survive by taking in dollars. And um, if, if, say I switched over to just vegetarian dishes at the restaurant, you know, and that they were good, composed vegetarian dishes, um, you know, we'd go out of business. Um, even if there was, we had just as many customers a year. So even if the customers all say, hey, this is great, we don't see the expected drop off because a smaller portion of the population, you know, would be interested in us, um, we would go out of business. And the reason is because I can charge 28 to $32, $34, uh, you know, the steak that I opened with, the most expensive thing on my menu 10 years ago was a ribeye, it was 20 bucks, um, and everything was in the teens, which is exactly where I wanted to be, but we were losing money, um, really hemorrhaging. That same steak is 36 bucks now, um, 
And so the reason I say we go to business is because we survive by taking real dollars in. Um, and we need the larger dollars. And you can't charge as much if you're not selling meat. Are these green dollars? <laughs> well, they, you know, it depends how you define them. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's the old problem, you know, issue in a restaurant. You know, I can sell, say, ribs and have, uh, you know, take more dollars in, but my margin is maybe small because I just can't mark it up quite as much as I could a pasta dish. So the pasta dish, I have a great margin on. The profit is really there. But, you know, you can't charge that much for it. So the question is, you know, I, I remember asking this as a 22-year-old restaurant manager in New York. I said to my boss, which do you want me to sell? Do you want me to take the bigger dollars in but have lesser margin? Or should I sell pasta all day and we'll really get the profit? He said, well, Jim, you want to sell both. And uh, I thought, well, that I don't understand that. Like, I want to sell one or the other more, don't I? No. And the reason is because um, you want profit margin. That's very important. But you can't take margin to the bank. You can't take a margin to the landlord. I need real dollars in. And so that's why I need to sell meat. And that's why I need to put sort of decent sized, I would rather sell a larger portion and have everybody take something home because I can charge more. If I, I actually, when we open, the God's honest truth, when we open, I wanted smaller portions that we, than what we have um, because I thought it was just the responsible, helpful thing to sell people. Um, I was hit by a car. You don't want to hear the whole story, but a BU kid went the wrong way down a one-way street. Two days before opening, I needed an emergency bilevel spinal fusion. Uh, you know, I was paralyzed from neck down, um, and um, I couldn't cook. You know, I fought my way back, and you know, now I write all the recipes. I write all the menus, but I can't really bang it out in the line like I used to. So I have three sous chefs who have been with me ten years. And they, you know, I'm like the puppet master, and, and they execute what I want. But when I went down for the count, the chef at that time, you know, put out large portions. Hmm. It's not what I wanted, but I could only control so much with a collar and a cane. <laughs> and uh, five days after we opened, the plane slammed into the World Trade Center. Oh, my God. So we had enough trouble as it was. I just couldn't oh control everything, and the portion size was larger than I wanted, and I just couldn't stand long enough at the line watching the food come out because my neck and back hurt too much to actually control it. And so after a while, everybody got used to these bountiful portions, which went with the sort of rustic food that we did. So it's actually something that's gotten away from me, and I would like to reel back, but I just sort of can't now. But you know, to that though, you have a great part of your menu that your appetizers are fantastic. And they're a good little small meal. Right. They're, yeah. they're, they're a good small portion. Right. So to that, I think you do offer small portions. I try. with right, I have, fantastic. I try to offer like five yeah. really good composed yeah. salads that you can have as a yeah. meal. They're you know, yeah. And I, I have, like you that know, like, oh, thank you. That. Thank you. And I try to have a lot of really good side dishes yeah. that you can, you can make a good vegetarian meal out of. So I try to put it out there. I just don't really right. totally rein it in. Right. And, and just to address that question, what some restaurants are doing, like it's not an all or nothing thing. Whether it's the vegetarian or the organic or the portion size, what's about is choice. Because the reality is, in that group of five people eating out, you're going to have the diehard steak eater who's eating meat three times a day. Then you're going to have another few people who go out for steak once a week. But you're also going to have that person who's a vegetarian or a flexitarian or who's a heart patient and is more a heart patient, somebody who needs to watch what they eat in terms of meat. So they're going to have pasta or they're going to have salad or a piece of fish. And so we're in an era where the diversity is where a restaurant really succeeds because in a group, you're going to like they have both, even in a couple. You know, I'm vegan. My wife is mostly vegetarian but is an omnivore. 
And so if you're having us over, you want to have some different options. And that's not so uncommon these days to have that. Even one person might be committed to say, okay, I'm in my vegetarian meal right now. Yeah. Like Eric, oh, oh, wait, hold on. I haven't had my meat meal now. I'm definitely having a steak today. You know, and you want to be able to accommodate him on different days. And if it's all steak, you might lose him on that day. I'm difficult. Yeah, but, but you're not uncommon anymore. There's a lot of Americans are flexitarian or have that, uh, that, that disposition to, to dabble in, in, in different things. Do you have a question? Yeah, we can say I, I'm, on, I'm uh, serving on the Solid Waste Advisory Committee here in town. I'm just to follow up on your question, uh, it's, it's much better if you have reusable things. It, it, it's so much less energy to, to reuse something than to, than to grind it back down into pl uh, glass bits and make another bottle or another glass. I would think. And uh, in the same fashion, in Brookline at least, or in Massachusetts, if you take your beer bottles back to the uh, store where you bought them from, they send them back to the manufacturer, and they have to deal with them, but at least they're, 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 they sort them by color, <laughs> so that when you put your glass out and your single stream recycling, it all gets ground up, and uh, it's um, used as like road fill or something. Yeah. It, it, do, it doesn't go back into bottles, because it's they want white glass usually, and once you mix yeah. in uh, beer bottles or wine bottles, which are colored, the value of it is, is zero, it's negative really. So. Uh, uh, it's always better to, to use, and those, and those milk bottles and beer bottles that you had, were, yeah, that was a, that's a major thing. But I remember when, before Whole Foods, back when they were uh, bread and circus, they used to sell uh, spaghetti sauce and stuff in reusable uh, ball jars. Mm -hmm. And when they became Whole Foods, they, they quit doing it. But the margin was really terrible because, you know, to buy a ball jar, you know, with a reusable lid, you know, it's like, a, it's like 50 cents or something. <laughs> You're paying like 50 cents for the packaging, and, you know, Three dollars for maybe the spaghetti sauce or whatever it was, or tomatoes or olives or something. So uh, they just got out of the business, and now it's all plastic tubs, which are a nightmare. Be conscious of the time, we're ready. For yeah. So we can probably wrap up. And you can stay around the top if you want. But Do you want to tell people about what you have? Do you want to pass them around? You can pass them around if you want. I mean, this is these are. Um, I brought these. They're specific to Washington Square, but you can um, ignore that if you don't want to go to Washington Square. We'd love you to come, but. What you've got is a, just a fact sheet with some basic information about what the energy impact of restaurants are, the water impact. And then on the second page, you've got a sample set of coupons, um, some that I did here, which are Washington Square, and then some of Michael's from Dying Green, that you can use. So you can go download more on your own, but I had already printed these out because I want to kill more trees. Than we can. I have the coupons online. Go to dyinggreen.com, and that, that well, website is on this paperwork. You can download as many as you'd like. So once you pass them around, and if you want to be part of the, the neighborhood meals, just make sure you give me an email address before you go, and we'll keep you in touch and add you to the list. And so, thank you so much for uh, yeah, thank you. grateful for, thank your, you. for your attendance. Thank you so much. We're happy to stay around and a answer questions. And anybody that wants to be on the Dine Green newsletter and be kept up in general, feel free to give me your email. It comes via the internet. Okay, so what's your email?